Anyway, Percy Jackson. Feel free to cut that. <laughs> no, no, we're keeping it. Hey, tangents, baby. If there weren't tangents, just read the book. If you don't want the tangents, why would you listen to a podcast? What's good? Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of The Newest Olympian. My name is Mike Schubert. I'm the titular Newest Olympian. I'm a 30-year-old man who never read the Percy Jackson books as a kid, but I'm reading them now for the very first time as an adult because I'm on a quest to determine if this is a book series that we, as a society, have been sleeping on. But I'm not on this quest alone. Today, I'm joined by library technician, partner of the great Misha Stanton, and everybody's mom, Erin Bark. Erin, how's it going? Hi, Mike. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. I am excited to have you on the show. I know you are a big, big PJO fan, and I'm glad that you gave me the note to say that you're everybody's mom, because I believe when I was introduced to you many moons ago at PodCon 1, I believe I was first told, oh, this is the pod mom, (laughs) Erin. So I feel like my first introduction to you was, oh, this is my mother who I haven't met yet. So I feel like it's a a fitting introduction. Yes. I actually remembered that because... We were all sitting in the back of the PodCon hall at the meetup, the very first minute of PodCon. And I'm like, wait a minute. Is that I hear a voice? Is that Mike Schubert? Is that the Potterless guy? And I asked Misha just to make sure. And I'm like, can I go say hi to him? And it's like, yeah, you can say hi to whoever you like. Everybody's very cool here. And I walked up to you. I'm like, hi, Mike. I really like your show. I listen to Potterless all the time. It's nice to meet you. And you freaked out out. You had never had a fan come up to you before, and you're like, oh my god, I have to get a selfie with you right now. (laughs) And it was so cute. It was very surreal. I was living in Seattle at the time, and PodCon happened to be in Seattle. I'd been doing this show for a couple of months, and it was a tiny little baby podcast that still had a sizable listenership, but compared to what it became, nothing. And yeah, it was the very first thing and the first day, and I had never done any sort of podcasting convention or meetup or anything of any sort, and this was at the opening ceremonies where I didn't know who the McElroys were. This is how new into podcasting I was. I was like, who are these people on stage with Hank Green? I don't know what's going on. (laughs) And then, yeah, just right off the bat, the greatest way to start it. A very nice person saying that they knew who I was. It was very kind of you. And it just set the tone for the whole day, convention, and career. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So... We're here to talk about Percy Jackson and the Titans curse. We're going to do all of chapter five. But before we get into that, Aaron, what is your history with the PJO books? How'd you get into them? When did you start reading them, et cetera? Well, like you mentioned at the top of the show, I am a library technician. I actually just got my degree. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I just got my degree recently, even though I am also a 30 year old, <laughs> <laughs> is because instead of doing college right out of high school, even though I volunteered in the library the entire time, I did Renaissance fairs on the road. Amazing. And a fun thing about Renaissance fairs is that a lot of people don't make enough money to buy their groceries and wash their clothes in the same week. Mm. So a lot of times church groups show up with like free food and extra clothes and Ah. a lot of times free books. Okay. And I was all over that. I had more books than boots in my car as I drove (laughs) around the country. I started doing that when I was 19. And that's actually where I first got into the Percy Jackson books. Okay. Because they were free, they were available, and I seemed to see the whole series in every fair that I went to in those free boxes. And it's like, okay, maybe it's time. I saw these a bunch getting checked out in high school. Maybe it's time to have a look at this. And I got so into it. That's so fun. That's a fun story. So if you were 19, I guess, the books would have been mostly done. Like, were they all out oh, at yeah. that point? They were all out okay. by then. And after that, he started the Heroes of Olympus and mm-hmm. all the other ones. And I have just kept on going. Great. So you've read all the spinoff stuff, all of the sequel series and all that goodness? Oh, and everything presented by Rick Reardon, because I really like mythologies. Okay, great, great. Yeah, I'm definitely going to be covering the sequel series. I have to figure out exactly the order, but I feel like I'm going to go PJO, then Heroes of Olympus, and then I know there's The Trials of Apollo and The Kane Chronicles. Yeah, I'll probably default go. to just publication release date when I get into that stuff. But for sure, PJO, HOO, I know that. But yeah, maybe we'll see how things go with the podcast, but I would gladly dive into the Ryordan Presents stuff because it all sounds really cool and I like the books. So let's keep it going. Heck yeah. 
and get your representation in. Yes, uh, that's the other really cool thing is what I do know about the Presents books. Rick recognizes that he is a white man and shouldn't <laughs> necessarily write about every other culture, which is great to recognize. Many authors don't recognize this. And for him to have that foresight is very smart. And it makes me just respect him and like him. What a lad, that Rick Riordan. <laughs> yeah, agreed. <laughs> The Arusha series. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and making a mental note for the future. Call me whenever you want to get into the rest yeah, of Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a call a in 20 years. <laughs> That's literally my job. <laughs> Amazing. So we're going to start it off with chapter five, which is called I Place an Underwater Phone Call, where we last left our heroes. We had just met Apollo, who was quite the character. Oh, yeah. What an interesting lovably hateable, hateably lovable. You love to hate him, Apollo. We met him. We had a very interesting car slash bus ride. And now we're here back at Camp <laughs> Thalia. What was Poor your first Thalia. Uh, driver's experience like? Ooh, so I drove, I believe, my dad's old Nissan Maxima for the very first time when I had moved to Texas and I was then starting to get my permit and all of that. Growing up, though, when we were in New Jersey, I moved when I was 14. So before moving, we had a big yard in New Jersey because houses are pretty spread out and we had a big riding mower. Oh, no. So the way that my dad made me not hate mowing the lawn was he told me, oh, if you do the riding mower, it will help you learn to drive. And I thought it was fine. I was young enough at first when I started mowing the lawn that I thought, oh, cool, neat. And then as I got older and he kept saying this line, I was like, all right, dad, sure. OK, yeah. How real can this be? Then when I started driving, it was super easy because I was just mowing the road and it was so easy. So. <laughs> I, from day one, feel like I've been a very solid driver. Learning to drive in Houston, Texas is like learning to drive on hard mode because of yes. all the highways and feeder roads and beltways and then the absolute ridiculous human beings that drive in Houston <laughs> who don't know what turn signals are, never heard of a blinker, never met her, just mm -hmm. the most ridiculous drivers out there. So I feel like I'm very good and I'm I'm validated in that. This past weekend, I was doing a live show for Potterless in Asbury Park, New Jersey, and I was driving with Eric Schneider, and an hour into the drive, he said, Mike, you're a really good driver. I had no idea what to expect for someone who's lived in New York for the past couple of years and just takes public transit everywhere. But you're a very good driver. And oh, man, that just made my day. <laughs> Schneider is absolutely adorable. What a wonderful human. <laughs> was your first driving experience okay? My first driving experience was... I think I was six years old in my mom's lap and the car was just packed with things because we were driving down to Maryland for the summer. Mm -hmm. I was being fussy. And so she's like, OK, we're off the highway anyway. So she put me in her lap and I would sit in her lap as she was driving and like put my hand on the gear shift and she would shift and I would feel like I was driving. That was my Whoa. first driving experience. <laughs> that is very cool. Yeah. What a fun mom you got. Yeah. She's pretty great. <laughs> That's great. So. We're back at Camp Half-Blood, and Percy is surprised to see Camp Half-Blood in winter form. It's basically Christmas edition, which is very fun. He's only ever been there for the summer, so it makes sense. Nico is amazed by the climbing wall, and Percy says that he will introduce Nico to Chiron, and then he begins to ask Zoe if she's ever met Chiron, and she sternly says that she has, and she instructs Percy to tell Chiron that she and the hunters will be in cabin eight, and she even tries to shut down down Grover, showing them the way, which is absolutely inexcusable. But thankfully, <laughs> Grover's perseverance prevails, and he goes anyway, despite stumbling and bumbling the whole way like a fool. That's persistence right there. That's dedication yeah. yes. to your craft. <laughs> and you need it. He's a leader. He is supposed to do this sort of thing. I don't understand how anyone could dislike Grover, so I'm glad that he stuck to it. Now, an interesting thing that happens is that just before Bianca leaves with them, she leans over to Nico and whispers something in his ear. She looks to him for an answer, but he just scowls and turns away. So clearly there is tension between the two of them. I don't know if we're ever going to learn what these things that they've been whispering back and forth for the past couple of pages. I don't know if we'll ever learn what is being said, but at the very least, it's pretty clear Nico's not super happy about Bianca's decision. And understandably so. Yeah, I mean, you can imagine how he must be feeling after yeah. being told. I mean, this has only been, what, an hour since he's found out that Gods are real. Mm -hmm. So are monsters. He's a demigod. Everything that is cool in his life, everything in his mytho magic deck is 
real. Oh my gosh, this is so cool. But at the same time, he's losing his sister to it. And it's like, but I thought we were going to do this together. Right. And then it's especially weird because she's still there. It's not like she said, bye, I'm abandoning you. And then she's gone. She's still there, which is the worst. I know it's different because they're siblings, but it feels kind of like when you break up with someone and then they're still friends with all your friends and you just don't want to see them because you're upset about it. That always sucks. And this feels like an alternate version of this. I know that you're the younger brother in your relationship. Yes. I am an only child, so I never really experienced this. But did you ever have an experience where, like, your sister was having a sleepover and you just wanted to hang out and they were like, oh, my gosh, get your little brother out of here? Thankfully, no, because my sister is four years older than me, which is just the right buffer zone of not close enough where my mom would say, oh, bring your little brother along, but not far enough where she couldn't, you know, help me out when I was going to my first middle school dance and stuff. So (laughs) we had the right buffer level of never getting into annoying brother territory, but then also never me wanting to because it was like, oh, I don't want to hang out with Megan's friends. I want to play Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 with Chris (laughs) Bodil. Understandable. (laughs) It's just a great game. So Apollo says goodbye to the hunters and he calls them sweethearts, which he was explicitly told not to do. (laughs) And he tells Percy to watch out for prophecies and for Thalia to, quote, uh, be good. So at first I was thinking, Okay, fine, whatever. But then Tinfoil Hat Me was thinking, oh, is he telling Thalia because of the prophecy to be good and not the weapon? Huh? Especially because narrator Percy says he gave her a wicked smile as if he knew something that she didn't. So it felt less like Apollo just not knowing what to say and instead trying to say something without saying too much. Either that or I'm entirely reading too much into this. <laughs> I mean, those are all valid theories considering what you already know. Thank you, thank you. About the prophecy, about the age, about the big three. We'll have to see, and I appreciate you for not giving away any sort of hint at all. The joy of a TNO guest. So Nico asks who Chiron is, because he doesn't have Chiron's figurine, and Prissy says that he's the activities director. Nico says, quote, if those hunter girls don't like him, that's good enough for me, let's go. And I love this. (laughs) I just love the grudge. It's phenomenal. He's so sassy. Mm Mm-hmm. Gotta love it. He's sassy for a 10-year-old. Yeah. That's entertaining. To watch. Yeah. It's always fun whenever you see a sassy 10-year-old on the internet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is just sassy 10-year-old at a medieval camp. Yep. (laughs) Primeval camp. (laughs) So Percy is also surprised at how empty Camp Half-Blood is. He knows that it's only year-rounders, but it still seems like there should be more people. And I'm guessing this is him thinking, oh, maybe some of the year-rounders have left to join Luke slash Kronos' side, which would be very sad. We do know that some of our fan favorites are here, though. Beckendorf is here, and so are the Stoles. And Clarice should be here, but we'll learn what's going on pretty soon. Yes. Narrator Percy then says, quote, Chiron's brown beard was shaggier for the winter. His curly hair had grown a little longer. He wasn't posing as a teacher this year, so I guess he could afford to be casual. He wore a fuzzy sweater with a hoof print design on it, and he had a blanket on his lap. And I am very much here for comfy, cozy Chiron. Oh, yeah. Lean into it, buddy. Yeah, this felt like when you watch Scooby-Doo and they have a winter-themed episode and everybody's wearing winter versions of the outfits they always wear. It's the same color, same sort of stripes and patterns and stuff, but it's just a puffy vest instead of... they exchange gifts, it's always, like, exactly whatever matches their personality. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I mm-hmm. like that he's still Chiron, but he's winter Chiron. You know, he's put on his winter video game skin. <laughs> So Chiron is excited to see them, and he's excited to meet Nico, and he thinks that the mission must have been a success. But Percy then says, well, which immediately worries Chiron, and then Chiron asks, where's Annabeth? And that prompts Mr. D to say, in a bored voice, quote, oh dear, not another one lost. And I have just had it up to here with Mr. D. I am so upset with him, but at the same time, the Disney Plus show casting him as Jason Manzukas is absolutely perfect. <laughs> So it's going to be great, but also, I just can't stand him. He's so grumpy. Get out of here. And there's a way to do that in a way that is lovable. Mm -hmm. And you also have to get in Mr. D's head. I kind of feel for Mr. D. Like, okay, you chased a wood nymph. This is punishment. This is probation. And it sucks. But you're also around kids. Right. And what's worse than eighth graders? Seriously. And I know that I'm going John Mulaney here, but what is worse 
than eighth grade boys. I don't think anything. And I recently was talking to one of my friend's moms who's a middle school teacher who taught all different years. And I just asked her, of all the years you taught, what was the best, what was the worst? And we got to the worst. She hesitated for zero seconds and said, the eighth graders. Mm -hmm. And that's generally the age that they come in at or they spend their time here Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for that age. And that is the worst. Right. And he's tired and he's old and he's not allowed to drink. Yeah. yeah. The problem with the Mr. D situation, which Percy gets into soon, is that he makes it everybody else's problem. I get that you're in a situation you don't want to be in, but you're making it everybody else's problem and then you're – being a detriment to their learning experiences. It was giving me lots of vibes of Snape where, sure, he's at the school for a purpose and then he also has to teach. But because he's so grumpy about stuff, he's just a worse potions class teacher. And it's frustrating because, yeah, we get it. I understand you're in a situation you don't want to be in. But on the other hand, just like you said, Aaron, these are kids and they deserve the best. And it's not nice of them to not get the full teaching, learning, oversight experience that they should have. I like your Snape analogy. It is very appropriate because when you look back at the books, like, and this is going back to Potterless a little bit, Snape is not a bad teacher. He teaches in the same way that one teacher in high school that you always thought was too hard. Mm -hmm. And then you got to college and realized, no, they just teach like a college level course Mm -hmm. in high school. I actually appreciate those teachers more. You don't at the time. Certainly, because they sound like a jerk and they assign too much homework. And it's like, why can't you ever give me an inch on any assignment ever? Snape did that. And it's not that he was bad at teaching. It's like he just had a chip on his shoulder and kids don't see that chip because they're not old enough to be experienced to notice that chip. Mm -hmm. I think it's the same thing with Mr. D. I think he's got a chip on his shoulder and the kids don't see it yet. And since Percy's the narrator, of course, it's going to sound like, oh, my gosh, he's such a jerk. (laughs) I think they just don't see that chip yet. Okay. And I think that you're going to find later in the books that maybe they should be appreciating his gruffness a little bit more. Okay. I think you're going to go back to this is what I'm saying. I'll circle back. The only thing I will say about Snape, yes, he might be a good teacher in terms of actually teaching, but I also think part of being a good teacher is not insulting your students for no reason. And the tooth thing with Hermione, completely unforgivable, and hating on Neville, someone who goes through a lot of trauma, and Snape knows what he's going through and picks on him just because. Like, at least he has a reason, a bad reason, but a reason to not like Harry, no reason to dislike Neville. Absolutely ludicrous. Yeah, I'll give you that. that he's rude to sweet, tiny Neville Longbottom. <laughs> but also, when Mr. D gets everybody's name wrong, you know it's because he already knows their name yeah. and he remembers their name. Uh, and so he's very specifically trying to say their name wrong to get a rise out of it. It's so rude. So he cares. Uh, uh, does he? Uh, uh, hey, I'll see. see. We'll revisit. I, uh, so the jury's <laughs> not out, <laughs> but I'm still frustrated by him. And that's fair. I was a little less frustrated with him because narrator Percy says, that Mr. D is wearing a neon orange leopard skin warm-up suit and purple running shoes. And that is just an incredible fit, and I have to respect it. Oh, yeah. Thalia asks who else is lost, but no answer is given as Grover returns, saying that the hunters are all moved in. Chiron frowns at this, and Chiron is being a little suspicious, not saying everything Chiron, classic Chiron, and in also classic Chiron fashion, he asks Grover to take Nico away to watch the orientation film. Nico asks the rating and is very excited when Grover says that it's PG-13. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody tells Chiron what happened, and he tells Mr. D that they must start a search for Annabeth immediately. Now, Thalia and Percy simultaneously volunteer, which I love, but Mr. D says, no way. And he considers losing, as you said, quote, Annie Bell, and gaining Nico as breaking even, which is a wild way to talk about humans as if they are inventory. (laughs) Not stoked about this. Mortals versus immortals, they are just inventory. I guess to a god, yeah. It's just really, they are so far beneath us that they don't matter in the grand scheme of things. I don't know if I think about it too much, but I definitely see the change there. This is the most important time in a kid's life. Every decision is dire. You can't dance with a girl without having a full-on breakdown. (laughs) (laughs) And here sits this god who's on his dry-out period where absolutely nothing matters anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's checked out. (laughs) So it's funny to see that that exchange. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So narrator Percy then says, I wanted to strangle Mr. D. It wasn't fair Zeus had sent him here to dry out as camp director for a hundred years. It was meant to be a punishment for Mr. D's bad behavior on Olympus, but it ended up being a punishment for all of us. And I think that's a really good point. It's not just affecting Mr. D. It's unfortunately bringing down the camp a bit, but per your suggestion, I may have a little bit of patience with Mr. D. We'll see. Mm-hmm. So Chiron says that Annabeth is wise enough to try and buy herself some time if she is in captivity. Mr. D then says that thus she needs to escape on her own, which causes Percy to get up from the table. And Chiron immediately goes, Percy, in a warning tone. And Percy knows that Mr. D isn't someone to mess with, but he's so angry that he doesn't care. And I am here for righteous anger, Percy Jackson. I'm all about it. I'm here for it. Yeah, I'm all about that righteous anger, too. But maybe, uh... Maybe snap your fingers or grip your chair a little. Maybe don't stand up to the immortal god that does not like you already. Yeah, maybe not the best course of action. He accuses Mr. D of being happy to lose a camper and wishing that they'd all disappear. He calls him a lazy jerk that should do more to save civilization since it's his civilization too. Mr. D pauses and begins to say something. Percy thinks he might be trying to curse him to smithereens, but then Nico bursts in. Thank God goodness, and yells, quote, so cool, you're a centaur, to Chiron, which is beautiful, and what a fun way to save Percy from being smited. Smited? Smote? Hmm, what is the past tense of smite? Goo, past tense of smite. Smitten? Smote, it is smote, ha ha, you have defeated me. <laughs> Not gonna lie, though, I like smithereened. Oh, yeah, smithereen, that's pretty good. Smithereen yeah, is Maybe that's some sort of, like, favorite. participle form. <laughs> Nico then addresses Mr. D by saying, quote, and whoa, you're the wine dude? No way. (laughs) Just, ah, Nico is so pure. I love him so much. What a fun guy. He's so good. And you got to think, this is the first time anybody has been excited to see Mr. D. Yeah. Like his whole time here. (laughs) That would throw anybody off. Oh, of course. Then again, you can attest to this. What was it like whenever I walked up to you the first time and you freaked? It was certainly (laughs) surreal because it had never happened for podcasting. I got a little bit of it with YouTube and Vine stuff prior, but it was the first time I had ever been, OMG, you're the guy. And it was very interesting and made me feel like a cool big deal, which was fun. And I immediately told myself, do not let this get to your head. You were just a boy who didn't read books and then did read books. (laughs) Some other stuff was in between, but yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And I did write in my notes after this exchange with Nico. I wrote, ah, so this is why everybody loves Nico D'Angelo. Because he's the best. (laughs) He is the best. This is not the only reason why everybody loves him. But you're going to find that later. I'm very excited. Now, Nico does have a Dionysus figurine in his game, Mytho Magic. And I wrote here because in between recording the first episode in which Mytho Magic was called out by name... And that episode releasing, someone tweeted at me, I can't wait for you to learn the name of the game. And I didn't think Mytho Magic was anything fancy. Like, yeah, myths and magic, Mytho Magic. Is it some pun that's going over my head? Like, does it sound like some other game that exists? And I'm just completely missing the joke. But when someone said, oh, you're going to love the name, I don't get it. I think it's a little bit funny because it's definitely... Rick trying to be cool with the nerds. Oh, like he's trying to, this is my Yu-Gi-Oh. It's got that same cadence as Dungeons and Dragons, Mytho Magic. And Magic the Gathering is a very complicated card game. Mm -hmm. And the Mythos is also another very popular role-playing game that you play figurines with. And so Mytho Magic is a combination and Rick having probably no idea that he did this. It's a little bit funny. Okay. But it's not as exciting as all that. But I am also excited to see why. I imagine that uh, Dionysus is not the strongest character in Mytho Magic. Mm -mm. Certainly not as strong as like Zeus or Hercules or I don't know if Hera would be in the game. Like Chiron's not in the game. Mm -hmm. I think it would be like Dionysus is more your magic user because he's got that whole insanity spell thing that he does, Mm. which has got to be very cool. Yeah, for sure. I think Mytho Magic just sounds like a believable name for a game. Like, I bought it. it. It feels legit. I don't think this exists, but have they made this a game yet? Because that just feels like another merchandising opportunity just on a silver platter. I don't know. I'm sure some fan has already made this, but... Oh, I'm sure a fan has, but I am just surprised that there isn't like a real one. Uncle Rick, why are you sleeping on this? Get on it. Yeah, I mean, Disney, contract me. Let's go. Let's <laughs> let's figure it out. 
<laughs> but I think it could be super fun. I'm hoping that once the TV show happens and hopefully explodes, that they will do a bunch of fun PGO-related merch and stuff. And to make a game, I mean, some of the stuff that they turned into games for Harry Potter, some of the stuff is great, some of the stuff is ridiculous. <laughs> Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle is fantastic. It's like Dominion, but cooperative. Wonderful. Hmm. Love it. Fun co-op deck builder. It's great. Does the game completely work on its own if it wasn't Harry Potter themed? Yes. You do not have to like Harry Potter to get it at all. I think they could do the same thing with Mytho Magic here where they could make the game if you're a Percy Jackson fan, you love it, and maybe it's just a good enough game on its own that people enjoy it. Here's hoping. Fingers crossed, baby. So Nico informs Mr. D that even though people think he is the weakest god in the game, he still thinks his powers are cool, which is just a fun... It's like, it's not a backhanded compliment. It's like an accidental insult. Like he totally meant well by it, but incidentally did a little sneaky dig in there. I call that a kid's compliment. Yeah, They don't know yeah, what yeah. they're saying. They're just excited, so they're talking. Very accurate. And you sort of have to parse out what they say. <laughs> totally. Chiron tells Percy to go with Thalia to the cabins and inform the campers that Capture the Flag is happening tomorrow. And Percy is confused because they don't have as many people as they normally would, but apparently it is a tradition when the hunters visit Camp Half-Blood, you play Capture the Flag, so now we're getting hunters versus campers Capture the Flag, and I think that that is very fun. So I'm excited for it. Oh, yes. So as they are leaving, Percy notes that Mr. D is very interested in the stats of the gods in Nico's game. So clearly Mr. D is angry slash jealous slash curious. Okay, if I'm the weakest, what are these guys' other stats? And that's the kind of thing that I think is very funny. You'll see this with professional athletes when they show up in the video games of the sport that they play. And then they'll be very upset if, you know, they get misrepresented. And there was one particular instance, I think this happened with Josh Hart, who's a basketball player, and he's one of the best rebounding guards in the league. And it's just surprising because shorter players usually aren't as good at rebounding. And at the time when this happened, he wasn't a very well-known player. So I think he tweeted something to the people who made NBA 2K. Hey, why is my rebound rating so low? I led the league in rebounds per game for guards, something like that. And then they realized this and bumped his rebounding stat by like 20 on a scale of <laughs> zero to 100. <laughs> Beautiful. And hey, I am all about the short guys in basketball. Yes. <laughs> and this might just be a goofy little story and probably not appropriate for this podcast, but more appropriate for horse. Hey, tangents welcome. I love basketball. It's staying in. <laughs> all right. 1940s. My grandfather is a kid in high school, probably closer to the 30s, I guess. And he is a short Asian Irish guy, like maybe five foot total, Okay, probably shorter than that. And they put him as point guard on his basketball team. And they're like, what? He's the tiniest guy. Why would we do this? And everybody was super, super confused. It came out the first game that he ever played that whenever they initially tossed the ball, instead of jumping, my grandfather would just reach out and grab the edge of the guy's shorts who was <laughs> jumping. And every single time the dude would stumble and his team would get the ball and like get the first basket every single time oh. until I think it was probably three games in. He had a reputation at this point. Right. And before the game... The other team almost got disqualified because the point guard ran up to my grandfather across the court, picked him up off the ground by the front of his jersey and said, if you do that to me during this game, I will f***ing kill you. <laughs> <laughs> That is incredible. That kind of happened last season in the NBA. There's a player on the New Orleans Pelicans named Jose Alvarado, and he would do this thing where he would pretend that he was out of bounds or on the bench or something, and then he would run back onto the court and come up behind people and steal the ball. And it worked for a couple of weeks until people realized, because it made its way into the scouting report, hey, this guy Jose likes to do this thing where he pretends he's not on the court, and then he sneaks onto the court. <laughs> but it was a very fun two weeks. <laughs> I love that. Hashtag short guys in basketball. Let's go. Shout out to Muggsy Bugs. Anyway, Percy Jackson. So once they are out of the big house, Thalia asks Percy why he would add another immortal enemy to his list when he already has Ares on his bad side. And Percy admits that it was foolish, but he cannot stand how unfair all of this is. And of course, he just loves Annabeth, so I get it. True. Thalia then looks at the tree and says everything's unfair. And yeah, that'll completely humble you when someone complains about something and then Thalia without saying anything goes yeah I was a tree yeah. for seven years so maybe yeah. rein it in a little bit bud 
<laughs> Problem is that she also agrees that it's totally unfair. Right. But also perspective helps. They're basically the same person, which sucks. Yeah. Because that person is either going to be your best friend or they're going to be your mortal enemy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're really trying for Annabeth's sake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Percy says that they're going to find Annabeth. He's not sure how, but they will do it. And Thalia has a little bit of doubt because first Luke is lost and now Annabeth is. But Percy tells her that she can't think that way. And Thalia agrees. And now the hunters are shooting hoops. They're playing basketball. And uh-oh, there's a fight that Thalia has to step in and break up. And look, I've played my fair share of pickup basketball. <laughs> there are lots of arguments that take place. I've seen people get into fist fights over pickup basketball. It's wild, but also completely believable. Oh, yeah. Glad Thalia stepped in, though. Particularly when there are weapons involved in this one. <laughs> right. Very high stakes here. It's not just, oh, a punch to the face by someone who's not very good at punching. There's swords and shields and axes and magic. A lot of potential things afoot here. Mm, projectiles. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So then Percy and Thalia discuss Capture the Flag team captaining, and they each say that the other person should do it, and then they uncomfortably agree to co-captain, which is just beautiful, awkward teenage energy that we love to see. Oh, yeah. And what happens next, I really do appreciate Big, mature boy Percy Jackson apologizes to Thalia for not waiting for the others back at the school when he chased after Dr. Thorne. I am so glad he did this. And Thalia says it's okay because she admits she probably would have done the same thing. I appreciate Percy swallowing his pride. I appreciate Thalia being honest. Look at this good friendship. I'm so here for it. Same person, different body. Mm. Best friend or worst enemy. I can kind of feel that. If I met myself, we'd either get along great or I would say that Mike Schubert is the worst. <laughs> yeah. Super annoying. What's with the loud shirts? Yeah, just uh, the pink <laughs> pants. Really? Ugh. The calculator watch. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, no. Bring it on. Making fun of myself is one of my favorite top 10 things for me to do. <laughs> then after Thalia debates whether or not to say more, she goes on to say, you know, you asked about my mom and I kind of snapped at you. It's just I went back to find her after seven years and I found out she died in Los Angeles. She, um... She was a heavy drinker, and apparently she was out driving late one night about two years ago, and and just oh, and Percy just jumps in and says, I'm sorry. And this is a tough situation for Thalia to be in, but also, I really appreciate Rick not shying away from covering some serious subjects in the book series. Absolutely. I know a bunch of kids whose parents, siblings, a lot of people who went that way. And it's not that life doesn't happen in teenage YA novels, it's how much do you couch it? How much do you pad it? Mm -hmm. And yeah, Rick's not exactly shy about talking about abuse when it was Percy's stepdad and Sally. Mm -hmm. He didn't shy away from it with this. He's not really afraid to talk about phobias or fears or insecurities. And I think that's why his books sound so real, right. why his books are so relatable. Because it's like, oh, yeah, I do remember being this awkward and feeling Maybe I should be a little bit more mature about this one thing and admitting that I made a mistake and feeling stupid about it afterwards. Yeah, and I think that's a good element. You talk about being relatable. I think with them being demigods, you have your Greek mythological-based problems that are still sad at times but not as relatable. But then you have the things that people can relate to that happen just to humans, mortals on Earth. And I think that that makes it hit more close to home than a high fantasy series where something happened because of orcs or whatever. Like, yeah, it's still sad, but people can truly relate to some stuff that might happen to them or someone they know, someone they love. So, yeah, I think... It's an interesting element that by being demigods, you can bring in real life stuff into these magical fantasy books and still touch on some tough subjects. So shout out to Rick for doing so and doing it in a nice, delicately put way. Notes for new authors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So after Percy apologizes, Thalia says, it's OK. It's not like we were close or anything. I ran away at age 10 and the two years that I was with Luke and Annabeth were the best of my life. So Percy puts it together that her mom is why Thalia was uncomfortable with the car, which is nice. And that does seem to rub Thalia the wrong way a little bit, though. So maybe Percy should have just thought this and not 
said this out loud, which I think is something that if you're a teenager, maybe you don't have the thought process to think, maybe just keep this one inside. But that does cause Thalia to shoot Percy a look that seems like her eyes could produce a million volts in an instant. And then she heads off to break up this basketball fight. Yeah. So here, let's take a little bit of a break for the Titans purse, our mid-roll break, where we talk about fun updates, such as new live shows that are coming through. Huh, TNO Tour. Let's go. Hey. Hello and welcome to the Titan's Purse. This is kind of like the mid-roll meets ASMR mic, which is a segment that I do at the very end of the podcast. And if you don't know what ASMR mic means, that means you don't listen all the way to the end of the podcast. What are you doing? You're missing out on very funny bits. So the reason I'm coming to you in a more ASMR type format is because I'm recording this from my friend's bathroom in Orlando, Florida at 1.43 in the morning. I was in Orlando for LeakyCon and I'm flying out very early tomorrow morning. My friend is asleep and I don't want to wake him up. So I've closed myself off in the bathroom with all of my audio equipment and I am trying to talk a little more quietly as to not disturb him and his two cats. So here we go. Let's get into the Titan's purse. Now, as mentioned in the lead up into the Titans purse, we have some TNL live shows on the horizon, the first of which is the first ever TNL live show, and that is taking place in New York City on August 24th, but it is also being live streamed wherever the internet is sold. So you can go to the newstolympian.com slash live to get tickets. And in addition to that, there will be four shows coming up that are half Potterless, half TNO. So on August 31st, we're going to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. That one will also be live streamed, so you can get double the live stream action. There's also a show on September 11th in Salt Lake City, Utah, on September 25th in Portland, Oregon, and October 9th in Dallas, Texas. Those are going to be very fun shows. A little bit of Potter else action, a little bit of TNO action. I'm very excited to bring all of those to you. You can get tickets to everything at thenewsolympian.com slash live. And while we're here, just a friendly reminder that if you go to thenewsolympian.com slash Patreon, you get access to a whole bunch of perks. One of the perks is you can get the episodes ad-free and early. So sometimes if I finish the podcast ahead of time, this is currently not the case because it's 1.45 a.m. on Monday, August 1st, when this episode releases as I record this. But when I don't have weekends when I'm at LeakyCon and very busy and traveling, and stuff. If I finish the episode early, you can listen to it earlier than Monday when the show comes out and they are completely ad free and you get access to those by joining any tier of the Patreon. And speaking of joining the tiers of the Patreon, I want to give a shout out to the newest members of our Patreon team who joined at the newsolympian.com slash Patreon. So shout out to our newest mega god tier patron, Morgan Hassel. Shout out to our newest super god tier patron, Allison Nimmo. Shout out to our newest god tier patrons, Tori Brewer, Weir Bishop, Annika Markovich, Chloe Taylor, and Stacy. And shout out to our newest demigod tier patrons, Murph. Percy Beth Love Boat, Jonathan Traverse's Hillel Friend, and Call Me They. And shout out to Brianna H. Betts, who upgraded their pledge. Thank you all so much. May Hypnos bless you with the ability to sleep very soundly, even if you're only going to get maybe an hour of sleep before you have to get up to get on your plane ride back to New York City. And finally, before I wrap up here, you're going to hear words from a few sponsors who make it feasible for me to be a full-time podcaster. Some of these ads will be read by me. Others of them won't. The ones that are not read by me are inserted locally. So if you live in sleepy time land, don't be surprised if you hear a sleepy ad. And once those ads are complete, we'll get back to this episode of The Newest Olympian. And we're back. Percy tells all of the cabins about the Capture the Flag plans, and Percy learns from an Ares camper that Clarice has been gone for a month on a secret mission from Chiron, which I'm excited to learn about in chapter 16 or so. (laughs) You've been reading ahead, Mike? No, but just guessing. I feel like the last four chapters are always when stuff gets really intense, and there's usually 20 or so. (laughs) Yeah. So Percy makes his way to the now empty cabin three because Tyson is doing his fun underwater adventure and he rests Annabeth's cap on his nightstand, which is so sweet. And he commits to himself that he will give it back to her when he finds her and he will find her. So sweet. He opens the damaged shield from Tyson and hangs it on the wall. And just poor Percy loses his best friend. His shield from his brother is all banged up and disheveled looking Not the easiest couple of hours for young Percy Jackson. Maybe not. But thankfully, Percy says to himself that he will ask Beckendorf at dinner if he can fix it, which I think is cool, and I trust Beckendorf to be able to fix it. (laughs) Narrative Percy then says, quote, 
I was staring at the shield when I noticed a strange sound, water gurgling, and I realized there was something new in the room. At the back of the cabin was a big basin of gray sea rock with a spout like the head of a fish carved in stone. Out of its mouth burst a stream of water, a saltwater spring that trickled into the pool. The water must have been hot because it sent mist into the cold winter air like a sauna. It made the room feel warm and summery, fresh with the smell of the sea. Thank you, Rick. Oh, he sets the scene so well. And thank you, Rick, for this thematic appropriateness, because that was the thing that Poseidon versus Athena, that's what lost Poseidon the city of Athens. Oh, this was the because thing he that he made. Because he created a saltwater spring instead of an olive tree. Oh, that's so cool. What a cool throwback. Right? Ah. Yeah. If you're going to put a fancy fountain in your son's dorm room cabin thing, yeah, it's got to be salt water. Yep. Yeah, it's going to be gray rock like the coast of Af Athens. Yeah, totally do that, please. Yeah, I do have to say, though, Athens made the right call in picking a tree. It's well, far more yeah, useful than a fountain. Olives are delicious. We're a very pro-olive podcast here. Yes. Even if you don't like olives, you probably like olive oil. So the olive tree is correct. The fountain, great. Not very useful, though. And I mean, there's uses for a saltwater spring, but not as many as an olive tree. Not as many. You can't even drink it. <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> you can't drink it, but you can trade salt from it. That is nice. Which is a massive industry, especially in ancient Greece. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But if I had to choose, especially cooking-wise, between olive oil and salt, I'd pick an olive oil every time. I'm going to have to fight you on that one. I Ooh. like food with my salt. Okay. I, I guess my thought is you can cook with salty foods without actually putting in salt. Like you can just incorporate some salty ingredients to get around it. There is no substitute for olive oil. But maybe this is just because I fear every Italian grandmother that I know from my childhood <laughs> attacking say, me. Butter? <laughs> it's just not the same. Grape oil? I mean, it's... Uh, most of my cooking knowledge is all Italian. So it's just like, yeah, okay, cool. So I've softened the onions with olive oil and put in salt and pepper. What's next? Like, I've got the garlic chopped to put in later. It's like every recipe just starts with that. <laughs> onions are very good for you. This is pod mom talking. Absolutely. <laughs> onions go in everything. So does garlic. Mm -hmm. And you don't put the garlic in right away. Don't oh. burn your garlic. Oh you God, put please. it in later than you think. Wait till the onions are softened which isn't the same as caramelized. And turn down the heat first, mm -hmm, just a little, mm -hmm. even if it's just one tick. Yep. Please, please stop burning your garlic. Don't do it. <laughs> Roast it, not burned. And I know that I'm going to get some hate for this one. You don't always have to use fresh garlic. Sometimes pre-minced garlic that's been sitting in oils or its own juices for a while so that it ferments just a tiny bit in your fridge is actually better. It is okay to use those things. You're not cheating. It's not my favorite. I like to do the half measure of cheating where you buy the already peeled garlic because peeling garlic is the worst. And if you go to the right grocery store, like if you go to a Chinatown grocery store here in New York, oh you can goodness. get a big Tupperware of it for not very much. You can also do it at Whole Foods, but they charge you like $9, which is obnoxious. No, like, you. sure, you've done the hard work for me. I don't know if you've that much done the hard work for me. No, 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 no. No, thank you, Whole Foods. <laughs> Little Tokyo Marketplace, your $3 two-pound pack of unwrapped garlic absolutely mm -hmm. every time thank yep. you yes find your local grocery stores one of the asian grocery stores will have this and it's well worth your money percy approaches this fountain he looks in and he says thanks dad and i like this because sometimes he calls him poseidon and sometimes he calls him dad so i like that he called him dad here he sees coins in the pool and he realizes what it's for, for keeping in touch with family. So he grabs a coin and he begins an iris message and he thinks about who he wants to talk to and he wants to talk to Tyson, which is great. I love that he's talking to Tyson of all the people he could speak with. He's talking to his brother. You love it. Here's a little tangent. Just because I am an audiobook fiend, mm -hmm. I love audiobooks, but some things in audiobooks annoy the crap out of me. And I don't know if this is because I am the future wife of the great Misha Stanton. <laughs> but if an actor is not saying certain words correctly, I can't get past it. And in the audiobooks, have you ever listened to the audiobooks of uh, the Percy Jackson series? No, but I have heard nothing but bad things about them. Here's a good tip. If you're in the greater L.A. area, download Libby, mm -hmm. which you can get free from uh, the uh, Los Angeles Public Library website. Okay. To download as many audiobooks as you want. It is very cool. They have a speed up feature. You know how like you listen to podcasts at like 1.2, 1. one. I love you to death, Mike, but I listen to you at 1.5. <laughs> Me at 1.5? Yeah. I talk so fast. How does that pop? There are people who said they That's listen at above two. I just, 
huh, power to those people. But I got yelled at all of the time. Any single class in school where I had to do a presentation for talking too fast every single time. I am flummoxed by anyone who listens to me at 1.5 or above. There's people who say they listen to me at 2, 3, 4x. I don't. Ah, power to you, though. <laughs> no offense, love. You're neurotypical. You're not going to get on this track. <laughs> but the way the narrators in all of the Percy Jackson books says the word cyclops is cyclopes. Oh, uh, yeah. It bothers the crap out of me every time. And I know it's coming and I have to put up with it because I listen to books better than I, I read them, mm -hmm. but it still bothers me every time. Yeah, it's interesting. I haven't heard that particular complaint about the audiobook narrator. I've just heard that some of the voices aren't great. Either they sound weird or they're mildly offensive, like Tyson is made to sound very unintelligent. And then I think later in the series, I've heard that there's a particular accent of a character who's from a diverse background and they do just a very stereotypical this is what people oh, like this sound like which is kind of yikesy so i am personally avoiding the audiobooks That's and right. uh hey if your friends want a cool alternative to the audiobooks there's this great podcast called the new olympian where i go so in depth that it's basically like reading the book basically yeah <laughs> <laughs> so tyson is mid forge work with the cyclops not the Cyclopes. So <laughs> it takes a bit for, and it is just Cyclops, right? Like you just say it the same, but it's spelled differently, but it means plural, right? It's Cyclops or Cyclopses. That, okay, cool. I don't know where he's getting Cyclopes. I get, I don't know, because you wouldn't say Cyclopes. I don't, it's just, it, I, it just feels like, I don't know. Maybe he's trying to super Greek it up where, you know, you say like Socrates, like he's throwing that in the mix. Yeah, and I mean, I worked at Ren Fairs and people still say like priv when they mean bathroom and wherefore when they mean why but mm. that doesn't seem to correlate oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. you come up with this and what editor let that go that's the big thing you can't blame the actor there someone's got to step in and say uh you're saying the word wrong so yeah. <laughs> i don't know how that slips by but anyway dyson is mid forge work with the cyclops so it takes a bit for percy to get his attention and then tyson is so excited that he runs over and he tries to hug percy through the Iris message, which is so sweet. I love it. Percy asks, how's it going? Tyson says that he loves it, and he shows him a sword that he made. Percy asks if he talks to Poseidon a lot, and Tyson says no, because Poseidon is busy worrying about a war, quote, old sea spirits making trouble. Ajaos, probably butchering that. Oceanus, those guys. And narrator Percy lets us know that these are the spirits who ruled the ocean in the days of the Titans. So, uh-oh, they're back. Mm. This isn't good. Cronus has returned. Some of his friends, his colleagues are coming back into the mix. So, scary future potential villains. It's calling your, uh, your one cousin to come to the wedding, and you know that because that one cousin's coming, all of the uncles on that side are coming. You're like, oh, please, no. One of the blessings of me having zero first cousins is that I didn't have to do the cousin line, which I feel like is always in the wedding invite thing because my wife Kelly has a regular amount of cousins. She has enough where you can't invite all the cousins. So then you have to decide where do we draw the cousin line? And I'm glad that I didn't have to draw that line at all. <laughs> I'm planning a wedding right now and I'm in the middle of that because I have 26 cousins. I... That's just my first cousins. Oh. Best of and luck. They all have kids. Genuinely, if you need wedding planning advice, let me know. I have lots of wish I knew this before kind of thing. Biggest pieces <laughs> of advice I would give set an RSVP deadline so that you know if people are coming or not. And then if you need to invite more people, you can do so early enough where it's not offensive. Because I had some people that I thought for sure were going to come RSVP no two weeks prior. And then that's just too late to invite someone to your wedding. They know they weren't invited. So <gasps> RSVP deadline really wish we would have done that. That makes sense. Anyway, anyway Percy Jackson. Feel free to cut that. <laughs> no, no, we're keeping it in. Tangents, baby. <clears throat> if there weren't tangents, this would just, just read the book. Like, I don't, if you don't want the tangents, why would you listen to a podcast? Like, <laughs> I don't understand. The audiobooks are there. Anyway, Percy Jackson Tyson says that they are arming the mermaids with swords to help out because apparently the old spirits are protecting the princess Andromeda so that Poseidon can't just destroy it with storms. So then Tyson asks about Annabeth, and that, of course, makes Percy sad, and all he can muster up is to say that she isn't here right now. He can't even bring himself to tell Tyson the full truth, which I get. I totally get, especially because Tyson 
is a bit more like a kid, so you don't want to just completely set him off into despair, especially when you don't really know what's going on. So I understand Percy kind of half-truth, white-lying the situation. Yeah. I don't know anybody who hasn't done that at least a dozen times in their life. Yeah, especially for someone who you're worried about how they're going to take it. This feels well-intentioned enough that I'm not holding this against Percy. Tyson tells Percy to tell Annabeth that he says hi, and Percy fights back a lump in his throat, and he promises to deliver the message, which, you know what? I trust that Percy, and, and I think it would be a great comedic moment if he does some big, extravagant, heroic deed to save Annabeth, and then the first thing he says is, Tyson says hi. <laughs> I don't know if it'll happen. An I'm hoping it does. Theory. It would be so fun. Tyson then explains that the Andromeda is going to the Panama Canal, which confused Percy, but I'm not confused because since they really heavily laid on San Francisco being a potential thing, I'm pretty sure it's on its way to San Francisco. Another excellent theory. I am skewed. I can't take full credit. I'm pretty sure I've seen the cover of the UK edition of the third book, which is wild. And I'm pretty sure it has a bridge on it. So if it's got a bridge and San Francisco has been mentioned, Putting two and two together here, so yeah. I can't take a full credit, but we shall see. Also, Annabeth was like, San Francisco, Percy, <laughs> it's right. Like, it was very heavy-handedly put in there. Fair enough. <laughs> now, Tyson has to get back to work. Percy tries to tell Tyson to tell something to Poseidon, but of course, because the plot demands, it is too late, and he's already gone, and the call ends. And that's just how things work when you're Percy Jackson in the books, and I get it. Now, at dinner, Percy is upset because he has to sit alone due to camp rules, which I think are wild. Can't there be some sort of thing where if you are alone, you can at least sit with the other alone people? Because Percy's at a table by himself. Thali is at a table by herself. Put them together. What are these rules? Eh, old school rules. It's just It's one of those rules where I get it, but also let's let kids not have to sit alone at mealtime. Absolutely. Feels very, you can't have, I don't know, shoelaces that aren't the same color as your shoes right. in school. It's like, yeah. who makes a rule like that? Why mm -hmm. was that the squeaky wheel? And even like I get it in a group setting, but clearly if they are alone, just put them together. No one likes to eat alone. Nobody, or I guess nobody likes to eat alone in a school situation where everybody else is having fun in the cafeteria. When I'm on the road, when I'm on tour for live shows and stuff, eating alone sometimes, great. I walk in, I read the menu. Once the person comes through, I've ordered. I'm in and out in like 20 minutes. It's amazing. <laughs> There's a difference between being told you have to eat alone and choosing to eat alone. There you go. There it is. And you also don't have to see a bunch of your friends having fun not mm -hmm. eating alone. <laughs> yeah. But Nico is sitting with the Hermes cabin because technically he's unclaimed, but the Stoles are trying to convince him that poker is more fun than mythomagic, which it just isn't. I understand if you're a Hermes camper, you like deception and all that, so you would like a game like this. But poker is very overrated. I'm not a big poker guy at all. I prefer Sushi Go for sure. Sushi Go Party is so good. They are not sponsoring the show, but Sushi Go Party, if you're looking for a great game that works in a big group or just with two people, Sushi Go Party is fantastic. It comes in a little metallic bento box too. It's so cute. It is so good. It's a really, really good, versatile game. I feel like there's lots of other games that involve deception that are more fun even if you're playing something like mafia or even bs the card game yeah. like there's lots of other stuff that you could play that are more fun than poker but i also get teenage boys like in poker i had poker parties with my friends in seventh and eighth grade like i get it because it was cool and i was a boy and you're trying to be mature mm -hmm. you're trying to do what the older kids do but i gotta think that if nico's really good at mytho magic which seems like a highly overcomplicated game you hope not, but you expect it to be. Mm -hmm. I think that he would actually absolutely kill at poker, right? I don't think the Stoles know what they're getting into for that. Yeah, it's hard because poker is half luck, half deception. Like, there's some strategy, but it really just comes with if you're going to bet or not. Whereas I would trust Nico to be more in tune with a more strategic-based game, even if there was one with a little bit of luck in it, like Settlers of Catan or Dominion or something. But True. I feel like poker is less strategy heavy. But because of that, maybe Nico won't like it and he won't become a poker dude, which I don't <laughs> think fits Nico's aura. That's fair. Now, the Artemis table is absolutely living it up. 
Percy does note that Zoe seems a lot more pleasant when she smiles, which makes me think of the song, This is the story of a girl. Cried a river and drowned the whole world. The more she looks so sad in the photographs. She absolutely... I absolutely love her, love her. when she smiles. smiles. Shout out to that song when it gets to the chorus at the end, when it double choruses and they do the, this is the story of a girl. And just being able to know that that one time there's the pause, huge point of pride for me in middle school. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you'll see it show up in a later Rick Riordan book. Who the song choices have been really good, so I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, that's fair. There have been some really, really solid needle drops in the books. And I've also (laughs) learned that in the different international editions, they change it up. Earlier in this book, they reference Jesse McCartney. But Mm -hmm. in the German edition, I think that it is the Backstreet Boys, which is a very different call. But I understand if you have to pick an American artist that people would understand. I feel like I'm going to do an entire either bonus episode or live show episode or something where it is solely just what is different in all the different translations because the soda in book two changes. It's not Dr. Pepper. It's Coke and Diet Coke. And I really am intrigued by all of not just like translation things, but just, oh, we have to change the brand or the artist or whatever to appeal to our audience. I think that's so interesting. Mm hmm. Now, Bianca also seems to be having a great time. She is apparently learning to arm wrestle from the girl who was about to get into a fight on the basketball court. So feels like the right person to learn from. But I did write in my notes, all caps, oh jeepers, because dinner ends and Percy goes to bed. And then narrator Percy says, I had a nightmare. And even by my standards, it was a whopper. Oh, yeah. So let's strap in. This is how we're going to close out this episode. And we are not getting into chapter six, but that just means we had a great conversation. <laughs> and yeah. that's... Sorry, I'm happy to come back if you need another guest. <laughs> oh, you've already cemented yourself as future repeat guests. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so Annabeth is on a dark, foggy hillside. She's struggling her way up around broken, black, Greek marble columns. She cries out to Thorn, asking why he brought her here. And maybe it's just because I'm recording this in July 2022, but this felt very Vecna, Stranger Things 4, running up that hill. I was imagining that song playing in the background while she is on this very scary struggle bus. Zoom. Sorry. Stranger Things. All good. I I only semi-watched it because Kelly watched it while it was in the background, but I got enough and I'm on Twitter enough to get the jokes. Fair enough. So she reaches the top of that hill, much to Kate Bush's delight, and she sees Luke in pain, and he is also looking quite rough. He calls out to Annabeth for help. She runs forward, and Percy tries to warn her to not do this, but his voice isn't working because it's a scary dream, and that's always what happens. Of course. Annabeth crouches down and asks Luke what happened, and Luke says, quote, they left me here, please, it's killing me. And Percy can't fully make sense of it, but it seems like an invisible curse is squeezing Luke to death. Annabeth asks why she should trust him, which I think is a very good question to ask. And Luke says that she shouldn't, but if she doesn't help him, he'll die. And Percy tries to scream out, but it's not going to work. He wants to scream, let him die, which is intense stuff from Percy Jackson. I knew he hated Luke, but that's quite a step. Eh, I can see it. Mm -hmm. I felt that way about certain guys in high school. I mean, yeah, I can totally, totally see it, especially from angry now 14-year-old Percy Jackson. So the darkness above Luke begins to crack and crumble like the ceiling is caving in, and Annabeth is able to hold it and prevent it from collapsing, much like Spider-Man across many different iterations of Spider-Man. Luke rolls free out of harm's way, and Annabeth then asks for him to hold it so that she can get out, but he says, quote, I knew I could count on you, and walks away. Annabeth pleads for his help, and Luke says, Oh, don't worry. Your help is on the way. It's all part of the plan. In the meantime, try not to die. And I just hate this guy so much. Just when you think you can't hate Luke anymore, he just finds a way to be even more hateable at every turn. Just wait. You're only on book three. I know. It's just like his trajectory of stink is only getting stinkier, and he's just... I can't anticipate it getting any better. Mm -hmm. 
Now, The Ceiling of Darkness, which I did write, I think would be a great book title. Percy Jackson in The Ceiling of Darkness, I think would really work out. True. It crumbles more and it pushes Annabeth to where she's smushed against the ground. And Percy sits bolt upright as he always does when he awakes. It's always described as him sitting bolt upright and he realizes, one, that Annabeth is in terrible danger and two, that Luke is responsible. And that is the end of chapter five and that is the end of this episode of The Newest Olympian. Erin, how are you feeling about this very chunky and intense chapter? Honestly, when I read it, it didn't feel that chunky and intense. But I like going through it with you because then it's like, oh, yeah, I don't think about these things because I've <laughs> read the series and, I, and I've reread them many times over mm-hmm. since I've gotten older. And, yeah, it's like, oh, yeah, that is how a teenager would feel about this guy at this time. There's a reason why your stuff's popular, Mike. Oh, that's very <laughs> kind of you. But it's also because I have great guests, which you were. And I appreciate Aww. you asking questions, having fun conversations and all that. But yeah, I think this chapter is not necessarily a chapter where a lot of things happen because basically they just got to camp, talked to some people, and then ate some food and then went to bed and had a dream. But I feel like this chapter is very much building on some of the things that have gone unsaid in the previous chapters. And it's setting up clearly the dilemma that Annabeth is in and we're starting to learn about that. So this was very much a understand where people's heads are at chapter, which I think leads to introspection, which leads to us trying to talk about what's happening next. And I don't really know what's happening next, but we'll learn that next episode of The Newest Olympian. But Erin, thank you so much for joining. If people want to find you doing stuff, is there anything that you would like to shout out or promote or discuss about libraries? The floor (laughs) is yours. I mean, absolutely. If you live in the greater Los Angeles area, get on the Los Angeles Public Library website and download Libby. Libby is where you can download any audiobook from any branch of any library in the greater Los Angeles area for free. And all you have to do is sign up online and then reply to the postcard they send you to wherever your physical address is to make sure that you do actually live in the greater Los Angeles area. And guest, if you are visiting in LA for any amount of time, you get this free without the postcard for three weeks. So if you're ever in LA, definitely download Libby. It's very cool, and it's a very nice thing to do, especially if you're not used to L.A. traffic. Yeah, L.A. traffic (laughs) is a nightmare. Well, that's a very great suggestion. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for joining. Listeners, thank you all for listening. And until next time, when we see perhaps what's going to happen in the aforementioned Capture the Flag game, I'll pursue you later. Hey, thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Newest Olympian. This podcast was created, hosted, and produced by me, Mike Schuber. I also run the website and the social media. Our editor is Sherry Guo. The music is by Bettina Kampamadis and Brandon Grugel, and the art is by Jessica E. Boyd. If you're all caught up in the show and you simply cannot get enough, fear not, because there are multiple ways that you can get more TNO into your life. First, you can go to thenewestolympian.com slash Patreon and get access to all sorts of bonus content, from bonus episodes to director's commentary to physical merch like pins and stickers, and so much more. There's also TNO live shows. You can see if we're coming to a city near you or if we're doing a stream show, which we are in the very near future, if you go to the newstolympian.com slash live. And you can also find us on social media at Newest Olympian on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, or on Reddit at reddit.com slash r slash the newest Olympian. Huge, huge, huge thanks to all of our producer level patrons, Lada Bartova, Kelsey Gillespie, The Damn Steam Nuggets, Emma Cooey, Vicky Garcia, Ellie Hoskovchova, Veronica Bartova, Haley Hastings, Robin Garcia, Frida Vickstrom, Megan Moon, Tough Bay Fong, Moo Moo Productions, Olivia Y, Craig McRoberts, Taylor Payne, Giselle Salvador, Can't I Seaweed Brain, Peter Johnson, The Twin, Sabrina Balsiger, Bone Pony, Heather McMillan, Casey Williams, Polly Burge, Nikki Harris, Tatiana Schmidt, Sandra Rose, Bridget Lowry, Josh Sayer, Josh Wilkie, Abby Ryan, Wise Girl, Ashton Gabrielson, Colby, Marco Redhouse, Falcon Joey, James, Christopher William Boucher, Lux, Caden Max, Sam Sam Reby, Carly Allen, Riley Kitas, Mary Kelly, Audra McKenzie, Mrs. O'Leary, Aaron Wood, Tyler Hendricks, Molly Snyder, Rodith Kalna, Milo Kim, Fred Cabras, Harlan Christ, CC Reads 23, Sand Cop, Julia Kendall, ML Oscar Thomason, and Noah Bungard. If you want to support the show in a non-monetary way, you can do so by getting the word out. You can talk about the show and social media, or you could think of someone that you know who would love this show. Maybe they're a big Percy Jackson fan. Maybe there's someone who's looking for that push to get them to begin reading the books. Whatever it is, if you recommend the show directly to someone, that would help so much. Or you could leave a rating and review on whatever podcasting app you're using. Anything really does help, and I appreciate anyone who has done this or decides to do so in the future. But I'm just so thankful that you listened to this episode, and I hope you tune into our next episode, where we'll be covering Chapter 6 and the beginning of Chapter 7 of The Titan's Curse with special guest Marissa Tandon. But until then, I'll pursue you later. Hey. 
Hey everyone, how's it going? It's me, ASMR Mike. As mentioned in the mid-roll break, I'm here in the bathroom of my friend's apartment in Orlando, Florida. So we're going to get a little bit of a bathroom ASMR to close out the segment. Here's me rolling uh, the toilet paper roll in a circle. Wow, I feel like a cat. Okay, let me stand up because I was sitting on the floor. I don't know if this is going to make a bunch of noises and stuff. I hope not. I'm moving cables around. Oh my goodness, what's going on? Uh, here's the sink. <laughs> that was really loud. Here's me scratching a towel. And here's me uh, turning on an electric toothbrush. It'll be very interesting to see what makes it through and not through from my sound editing software. But thank you so much for listening to this very interesting uh, edition of ASMR Mike. Goodbye.